It's a small, self-contained empire, looking like a Victorian Western and sounding like the Battle of Waterloo. An empire inhabited by a race so picturesque and individual, so fascinating in their behaviour, that it is a matter of surprise that anthropologists ever trouble to go abroad. Robin Fulton has paraded this way for 47 years. He's going to join the ranks of hundreds of like-minded men and women for a battle that's been raging for more than a century. That battle is fought here every year on 300 acres of Surrey countryside in wind, rain and blistering heat. In fact, in any weather, the sky cares to offload. The enemy that everyone has to fight stands not on some distant hill, but lies here in the mind, in a struggle to maintain a steady hand and an even steadier nerve. This is Bisley, and the struggle lasts two weeks. When the first meeting was held well over a hundred years ago, Queen Victoria marked the importance by making the most coveted prize her own, the Queen's Prize. The winner receives a medal engraved with the NRA's motto, Sit Perpetuum, let it stand forever, and 250 pounds in prize money. The competition takes place towards the end of the Bisley fortnight. It is open to all subjects in Her Majesty's Kingdom and Commonwealth, for a rifleman, it is the ultimate test. Robin Fulton won it in 1958. David Richards from Basingstoke won it in 1984 and is determined to repeat that success. But it isn't just the Queen's prize that draws these men and others like them to Bisley. I find the aspect of trying to beat oneself the most exciting. When every single shot is a bullseye until it leaves the end of the rifle, and it's up to me to make sure that it's a bullseye when it hits the target. I think Bisley is a very friendly place. One of the nicest things is the great mix of age. It's very common to shoot with somebody, say, 14-year-old and somebody on the target 84, and probably be beaten by them both. Bisley is a mixture of feeling terrified and feeling excited and feeling delighted if you've been lucky enough to do well. Bisley became the headquarters of the National Rifle Association in 1890 and is now the mecca of the shooting world. At times, the 20th century appears to have stopped at the camp's boundaries. The muzzle loaders who specialise in using black powder and lead keep alive old traditions. In spite of improvements in weapons and the general intrusion of modern life, parts of Bisley remain firmly, perhaps stubbornly, in another age. It's a little frayed, a little decayed at the edges perhaps, but maintained with pride. 
The distinctive style of Bisley's architecture is a reflection of the days when the British Empire was at its peak. The fabric of Bisley has hardly changed in over 90 years. The camp is flanked on the north and west by rifle ranges that stretch for two miles in both directions. It may well be that the isolation created by these ranges has saved the camp from the ravages of property developers. Come on, you stock us for God's sakes. To the east lies Purbright, home of the Guards Division, who also use the rangers. From its birth, the National Rifle Association has had strong military connections, although Bisley is, in fact, a civilian camp. But it is the military who dominate the first week of the July meeting. Amid the blossoming chestnut trees, Bisley turns khaki. Snap shooting and rapid firing are just some of the challenges, and the most spectacular to watch. This kind of marksmanship isn't simply for show. Running before you shoot isn't recommended in ordinary competitions if you want a perfectly steady aim. The military has always trained for active service and competitions such as the Queen Mary, which has been held since 1911, are designed to test shooting skills to the utmost. The Hamilton Lee is another competition for the fleet of foot. Here in 1949, the servicemen had to contend with an obstacle course more in keeping with a race at a holiday camp. The second week at Bisley, when civilians predominate, is not so formal, although the desire to win is just as keen. The division between the competitors in these two weeks is certainly more marked today, but in the early days of the National Rifle Association, the military connection was much stronger. In the mid-19th century, the defence of the realm was at stake and the association was formed to assist in defending the country alongside the British Army. For hundreds of years, the long bow was the established weapon. A man used it to protect his family, to defend his country, and they were laws to ensure a high level of individual proficiency. Firearms first appeared in the 16th century, but it wasn't until some 300 years later, about the time of the Indian Mutiny, that the rifle became the soldier's main weapon. In the early days, however, it was not the most reliable of weapons, particularly in the hands of the untrained, as the British Army learned to their cost. After the horrors of the Crimean War, the British became increasingly fearful of an invasion from what was fast becoming the strongest army in the world, that of Emperor Napoleon III of France.
Injured pride curdled with a sickening fear. And in 1859, there were increasing demands from all quarters in the land that forces of volunteers should be raised in order to face the dreaded invasion from across the channel. The government instructed the Lord's Lieutenant in every county to form a militia. The response throughout the land was enormous. And in under two years, the volunteer corps had become an army of 200,000. Enthusiasm for the rifle was fanned by stirring tales of daring do by American backwoodsmen. <laughs> rifle clubs began to flourish. Hundreds of rangers were built in a patriotic fervour. The Deptford volunteers even worked through the night building an earth ramp for their stock butts. But enthusiasm alone does not make a good marksman. To stop the French, the volunteer force would have to be properly trained. The man who took the initiative and called a meeting of all interested parties was Earl Spencer, great-great-grandfather of the Princess of Wales. The aim, they all agreed, was to encourage rifle skills within the volunteer force and to promote the sport of rifle shooting in Great Britain. So, in the year that saw the invention of the telephone and the election of Abraham Lincoln as President of the United States of America, the National Rifle Association was born. One of the association's aims was to hold a great annual shooting meeting. But the trouble was, where in London could they set up a series of rifle ranges? Woolwich, Epsom, Aldershot and Cobham were all considered suitable. But the final choice went to a site owned by the Duke of Cambridge, who happened to be Lord of the Manor of a park close to the heart of London, Wimbledon Common. I'm standing on one of the original butts where the targets were placed back in 1860. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that this wood, beloved of picnickers, pram pushers and dog walkers, was once swarming with men firing guns. <laughs> Even in those days, the common was bordered with houses. Earl Spencer had quite a job persuading residents that they would be perfectly safe. On the map, the rangers looked distant enough, but a misdirected bullet carries a very long way. Lieutenant Colonel Clark Kennedy of the 7th Dragoon Guards had carefully inspected the common, and his report was enthusiastic and reassuring. The ground generally is well adapted for the purpose. It is proposed to place 10 pairs of targets across the common facing the east at a distance increasing from 750 to 1,000 yards from the road forming the western boundary of Wimbledon Park. Provided that the usual and proper precautions are observed, I do not consider that a safer or more eligible site for the meeting of the association could be found than Wimbledon Common. Armed with the report, Earl Spencer confronted a meeting of the local residents who were naturally concerned about the arrival of a load of gunmen on their doorsteps. The Earl, dressed in the uniform of the volunteer force, used the report to diffuse their fears and stressed the importance of the rifle rangers in terms of the nation's security. He urged them to be patriotic and by the end of the meeting there were no further objections. <laughs> The first rifle meeting of the National Rifle Association was July 2nd, 1860. The sun rose from the clouds and the first genuine day of summer brought out the crowds. Her Majesty Queen Victoria graciously signified her intention of firing the first shot and her opening speech reflected the mood of the times and the patriotic spirit of the volunteers. I have witnessed with pleasure the manner in which the ancient fondness of the English people for manly and sylvan sports has been converted by your association to more important ends and has been made an auxiliary instrument for maintaining inviolable the safety of our common country. Her Majesty, accompanied by Prince Albert and Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister, entered an open-sided tent where a rifle had been specially prepared for her to fire. A bull's eye at 400 yards, not bad for a beginner. Quite a feat of marksmanship, you could say. But the credit should go not to the Queen, but to a certain Mr Whitworth, who built the rifle 
and designed a special rest. This system of counterbalance weights made the rifle perfectly steady and with hardly any wind to deflect the bullet, Queen Victoria and Mr Whitworth could not fail to hit the target. Because of the time needed to reload the early muzzle loaders, competitors worked in groups of five. At 300 yards they fired standing up and after each shot retired to reload. At longer ranges, to ensure a steadier aim, they were allowed to adopt the Hythe kneeling position, as taught at the Hythe School of Musketry. There were seven events ranging from 300 to 1,000 yards. Whitworth rifles were presented as prizes. There were 40 in all, and winning one entitled a volunteer to enter the final stage of the Queen's Prize. The great event was shot at 800, 900 and 1,000 yards with 10 shots at each distance. But the prestige of the occasion was not matched by the quality of the scores. They were low because none of the competitors had been able to set the sights of his new rifle for accurate shooting. The opening salvos were experimental and it was only by the end of the day that a marksman could be sure of his shot. However, even in these haphazard conditions, a clear winner emerged. He was Private Edward C.R. Ross of the 7th North Yorkshire Volunteer Rifles Corps. He was not yet 18 years of age and was to become one of the finest shots of his generation. Despite the low scores, that first meeting was a huge success. And when the prizes were awarded a week after the Queen's inaugural shot, the time summed up the aims of the association. We intend to have 100,000 men who can hit a dinner plate at 200 yards and a six-foot target at 1,000. We intend to make it an all-pervading feeling among our young men that he is not a man who cannot handle a rifle. The Wimbledon meeting helped unite the country in an unexpected way, one which was remarked on by a Belgian to a compatriot back home. It is asserted that the Wimbledon shooting produced an effect which was not expected. That mixing of the commercial classes and operatives with ability for a common objective destroys prejudices and gives place to warm sympathy and general confraternity. Today, beating the retreat is a regular feature of the first Tuesday of the annual meeting. In the early years, bands, tumblers, magicians and clairvoyants entertained the enormous crowds who thronged to the common. Outside the tents, pitched to accommodate the competitors, homely touches abounded, boxes and beds of flowers blossomed. In its formation, the NRA had another objective, which could not have gone unnoticed by European observers. The fierce competition to win the Queen's Prize was not confined to the competitors. Manufacturers began to improve the design of their rifles so that they too could claim to be winners. The Ely competition was introduced, which was restricted to rifles using cartridges containing their own ignition. Although standard in today's rifles, such cartridges were considered at the time to be too dangerous for regular military use. Increasingly, Wimbledon Fortnight became a testing ground for weapons, shooting techniques, methods of scoring and target indicating. Believe it or not, but in the early years you were not allowed to do anything but either stand or kneel when taking aim and certainly not adopt the back position as I'm going to do. 
Now, the story goes that this position was discovered by chance by a soldier during the Peninsula War. He lay down in the snow, placing his rifle like this, found that it gave him a really steady aim. And he fired a shot which killed the French General Colbert. And to prove it wasn't a fluke, he did it a second time from the same position and fired another shot which killed the General's orderly who'd ridden up to give him assistance. So let's have a go. Well, that's another French general gone. I've always been inherited an interest in ballistics and in firearms. And of course, that is the, the real attraction. Lord Cotslow's family have coached, shot in, and captained the English Eight for over a century. I've always shot her, uh, inherited the interest in shooting at the long range, and experimental shooting. Uh, my father did a good deal of the experimental shooting in the 1880s and 1890s, which led to the replacement of the old muzzle loading um, 450 and 500 military rifles uh, by the breech loading 303. In 1890, the National Rifle Association was forced to abandon the expanding London suburb and move to Bisley Camp in Surrey. The International Long Range Elko competition is now shot on Stickle Down Range at 1,000, 1,100, and 1,200 yards. Captain of the English Eight is John de Havilland, who has shot the Elko for 25 years. You're just now seeing the opening shots in this very tight match, with there being nothing between England, Scotland and Ireland. The wind is blowing strongly from the left. The allowance is continually changing. As I look at it now, the allowance will be something like 12 to 15 feet left. That is aiming one whole target up the line with a bullet rising, curling over the left-hand target and then dropping back onto the right-hand one. And the least variation in the wind can take you from one edge of the target to the other, and sometimes off it. A world record for long-range shooting over two days belongs to Piffa Schroeder, who scored 32 consecutive bullseyes at Cambridge in June 1986. She's vice-captain of the Irish team. There have been no misses so far. Uh, Mrs Schroeder has opened with a number of bullseyes for Ireland. Uh, the Scots have made a very strong start with nearly all their opening shots in the bull. And the English had a selection of inners and bullseyes. So the match is still as open as ever it was. England is 14 points in front of Ireland, and Ireland is 12 points in front of Scotland. And that, with 1,200 yards in an extremely difficult wind, is absolutely nothing at all. So it is really wide open. Before the final and longest range, competitors take a break for a spot of light refreshment at the English Eight Club. The appeal of strawberries and cream is obvious, but what is it about rifle shooting, and the Elko in particular, that attracts Piffa Schroeder? I think the Elko is special because it's the prime match rifle competition between England and Scotland and Ireland. And it was very important in the old days. It had full frontage in the times, and it was a wonderful thing, and the, the shield itself was hung up in the guild hall. It was all very important. I never shot until I got married, uh, and I was taught to shoot then. And then my maestro, Mr. de Havilland, taught me how to shoot in, in Scotland. And since then, I've just loved it. And I don't look forward to Bisley. I dread it every single year and wish that something awful would happen to me so that I wouldn't have to do it. And then the minute I'm here, I just love it again. Lemonade. 
If the drink puts you flat on your back, John de Havilland would approve. That's the position he favours for long-range shooting competitions. I like the back position because it's far and away steadier. You can hold your rifle almost as if in a vice. It's a very comfortable position to fire in. Fire your shot, sit up on your bottom, look around. Whereas if you're lying on your tummy, your rifle feels heavier and heavier as the day goes on. And you're also more or less obliged to use a telescope sight, which is an extremely difficult uh, device to shoot with. They're extremely difficult to read. Whereas the back sights are exactly right in one moment. And in general, the simpler the rifle, the more dependable it is. By 5.30, John's theories had been tested and had paid off yet again. In first place, England, with a score of 1,621. Second, Scotland, with a score of 1,588. And in third place, Ireland, 1,555. Three cheers for Scotland and Ireland. Hip, hip. Ready! Hip, hip. Ready! Ready. Prefabricated wooden buildings were a regular feature at Wimbledon. Today, the original NRA offices remain almost intact in the heart of Bisley Camp as Fulton's gun shop. George Fulton was by profession an engraver, but as a private in the 13th Middlesex, Fulton was also fascinated by the mechanics of the gun and how to improve it. He was himself a keen rifleman and a skilled one, so that when he won the Queen's Prize in 1888, he used his prize money to set up in business as a gunsmith. Today, G.E. Fulton and Son is renowned throughout the world. They manufacture the Fulton Regulator Target Rifle and repair and maintain everything from air rifles to muskets. The family is also acclaimed because three generations have won the Queen's Prize, a record as yet unbroken. George Fulton's son, Arthur, won it a record-breaking three times. His son, Robin, won it in 1958. But his memories go back even further, some 50 years. Well, I came to live in Bisley in 1924 when I was seven, and uh, I remember the, the Canadians... Um, um, here, the Canadian team and the Australian team. And, uh, I remember the Australians with their uh, hats like this with the uh, emu feathers in. Yes. And uh, I remember seeing the Canadian winner of the, of the Queen's, uh, the King's Prize, it was then, that year, being tossed up in a blanket by his uh, fellow uh, team members. The first and only woman ever to win the Queen's Prize was Marjorie Foster in 1930. Her success had a mixed reception in the predominantly masculine sport. It was a little bit frowned upon by some of the more die-hard males, or women who beat them all, but uh, everybody, I think, realised that she was a very, very exceptional shot and a very, a very fine person, really. What kind of woman, woman was she? Well, I would say she was a slightly mannish sort of woman <laughs> and very practical. Uh, she was a, an officer in the, uh, the 80th well, yes. uh, during the war, and she ran a poultry farm uh, at Trimley, not far away, but between here and all, all the shops. There are more and more ladies coming into the sport. Oh, yes, Is this a good thing? Yes, I think so. I think it's a very good thing. Um, and some of them do shoot very well indeed. They, yes. uh, they make uh, a very definite impact on shooting, and uh, I think it's a good thing for shooting. Piffa, is it a sport for women? I think it's a sport for anybody. I don't think you can be sexist about it. It's not particularly for men or particularly for women. I mean, men are brought up to play with guns and women aren't, but I don't see that it makes any difference. I think anybody who likes a challenge can do it. And do you think they can compete on equal terms? Absolutely. It's one of the few sports where they can compete on equal terms and until, you know, f f however old you are, you can still go on shooting. I look forward to being here as a very, very old lady, cantankerous and still shooting, I hope. To discover the joys of shooting for myself, Roger Millard of Fulton's introduced me to every model of rifle that's won the Queen's Prize from 1871 up to the present day. OK, Brian. 577-450 Martini Henry, introduced at Wimbledon, 1871, to replace the old Snyder. Yeah. Here's the cartridge, black powder. Close the lever. Loaded. Hold it tight. 
Open Good. the lever, just pull it down. Now on to the first magazine loaded 303 rifle, 1897. Longley Enfield. Cartridge in, close the bolt, and press the trigger. There you go. Number three coming up. Good old SMLE, the smelly now. Great War rifle, used in their thousands. Complicated to regulate for target shooting, but there's the 303 cartridge. Mr. Fulton won the Queen's Prize with this rifle. Is this the one they used in the 1418 war? Yes, indeed, it was. My dad would have had one of these then. I think he probably would. <laughs> you lost on the Somme. Successor to that, the number four. Slightly heavier, updated again to the 1920s, 1930s. Same rifle as previously, shortened again, more manageable and easier to manufacture. Gain in 303 caliber, many Queen's Prizes and King's Prizes on this rifle. Same rifle now, but the conversion in 1969 to 7.62, the standard NATO caliber. Loaded. This rifle been used to win every Queen's Prize since the change of calibre up to the present year. And then, now for the first time ever, a rifle other than an ex-military or a military design has been used. Yeah. This is a swing, SIN 71 M5. Loaded. Purpose-built target rifle. And good. And now you're up to date. Well, thanks a lot, Roger. OK, bro. Really enjoyed that. Good. Is your shoulder all right? Yep. The weapons and the mechanics of shooting and scoring have changed dramatically over the years, but the unique atmosphere of Bisley remains the same. It's one that is savoured by competitors from Britain, and indeed, from all over the world. This is one place where you meet all people from all walks of life, and uh, they are very friendly people. Uh, after the shoot, you chat together, you exchange ideas, and basically you're all in a very friendly mood. It's a great uh, challenge for us because we haven't got any practice to do this. Yeah. What about the social side? I mean, do you enjoy yourself? Well, tremendously. Yeah, there's no spare evening yeah, for us. Yeah, something is going on everywhere. I think for all Canadians it means an honour. To come here is uh, the highest honour to which a Canadian shooter can aspire. We have to compete to get on the team, and uh, the honour is the first thing. But second is the friendship and the good sportsmanship. That's, that's really the key to Bisley. Of the 30-odd clubhouses, one of the most attractive is the Canadian Pavilion, home of the Dominion of Canada Rifle Association, who have been coming to the July meeting since 1877. The building was erected in 1897 and clad with shingles of Canadian cedar. Inside the panel rooms are deer skin and the heads of elk and caribou, and a shield of Indian flint arrowheads. The walls are lined with photographs of past captains and prize winners, and every Canadian visitor hopes above everything else to be immortalised as a winner of the coveted Queen's Prize. The Richards from Basingstoke are a keen shooting family. For 1984 winner David Richards, this is his 12th Queens. His younger brother Bill has entered the competition nine times and is hoping for a place in the final. For Karen, David's wife, this is her second Queens and nerves still play a very big part. I shot last year, but I didn't really understand what I was doing. This year is... Um... It's making a bit more sense than it did last year. Are you nervous? Very, very nervous. <laughs> what about you, David? Mm, feeling pretty psyched up. He's a big head, really. Bill, are all shooters nervous? Yes, I think they, they do get nervous. I, I think you've got to be a little bit nervous, otherwise you won't do your best, because you've got to have that little little bit of spark. Little edge. Yeah, you've got, you've, got to be, um, you've got to be able to concentrate, and if you're not nervous, then you're not giving your full effect to it, because yeah. you've got to concentrate on that as well. The first stage of the competition is shot at 300, 500 and 600 yards and only the top 300 scorers go forward to the second stage. Many of the markers in the butts are competitors waiting their turn to shoot. 
Andy Chown from Camberley, a shot for Great Britain on 12 occasions. He's one of the favourites. Good morning, Andy. Hello, Brian. Welcome to Bisley. Nice Thank to you. see you. Thank you very much. Are the scores going to be high today? Very high, I should think. It'll be uh, a day of a tie shoot on 105s, probably. <laughs> Why are they going to be high, though? Well, the flags are meandering along fairly well down the poles. I only no wish wind at all? Were... Not a lot. What about the light? Ideal. Nice dull light. Brings the target out in contrast to the stop butt. Yes. No glare, very little. And uh, probably as the day goes on, it should remain as it is, I think. And uh, how do you feel? Quite nervous at the moment. <laughs> Eager <laughs> anticipation. Are you going to win? I'm going to have a jolly good go. <laughs> Another competitor chasing his win 28 years ago is Robin Fulton. How many business is this, Major Fulton? Well, this, uh, I can't work it out, out of my head, but I, I started shooting in 19... 33, that was my first busy meeting. And how old were you then? Uh, 17. 17. Yeah. Yeah. I'm now a little older. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you think you're going to go on today? Well, I don't know. One can't forecast this. You get part of the good things about shooting. You, it's quite impossible to say what's going to happen, so you, uh, you just hope for the best and try yeah. your hardest. Good luck. I'm yeah. sure you'll do need, very, very well. I need indeed. your, your good wishes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first stage of the Queen's. Message one, all targets, please. Good shooting. Every competitor has nine shots at each of the three ranges. The first two don't count as they're for sight setting. The seven shots that follow are critical and a maximum of five points are given for each. A possible is when everyone's a bullseye and the final score is 35 out of 35. David and Karen were to shoot in the first detail. Bill was in the third. With 1,243 starters, competitors have to wait their turn. There's a lot of equipment here, Bill. What's it all for? Well, uh, most of it's pretty essential. I mean, you've got a telescope, and you've got a shooting jacket and a thick jumper. And then you've got uh, waterproof trousers, wet weather. Waterproof cape for even wetter weather. Glove. A hat in case the sun ever comes out. You've got uh, your ear defenders, which are absolutely essentially good deaf. And you've got uh, a box for your ammunition with a pencil and a pen in. Um, then you've got, uh, I need shooting glasses, so I've got uh, my shooting glasses. Well, show us those. Yeah, sure. They make me look like a cyclops. They're wonderful things. Yeah, great, these. <laughs> we then got uh, a school book with all the Past score sheets in, so you can check on elevations and things for the next shoot. Uh, and then you've got wet weather score sheets and more rain. Um, then you've got three, no, four, four towels, um, two chamois, and this is a torque wrench. And this, this to set the bedding screws up the way, for the same weight each time. And, and basically, what what you do is you just you just put it in there, and when it when you're on the right right weight, and uh, what it does, it simply goes click when it uh, gets to the end of the, the stop, as it were, so, so it's the same weight each time. Yeah. The most essential part of the equipment, apart from the rifle, is a good telescope. I can see at a glance what each shot scores because the marker in the butt puts a red scoring panel along the bottom of the target. If the scoring panel is on the extreme right, it's a bullseye. If it's on the left, it's an outer and a low score. If you've got a telescope like I have, the bullet hole is marked by a red spotting disc. And that's when the shooter can start adjusting his sights. 
absolute self-control is no guarantee of success because the enemy within is not the only adversary. Every weather condition is a potential hazard. It must be assessed, sometimes anticipated, always allowed for. Grid lines on the score sheets are multiples of sight movements and the bullet's elevation or sight position can easily be changed. Rifle sights are vernier scales and each click or unit of movement represents a minute alteration of the aiming point on the target. If everything else remains constant, the next shot should be a bullseye. Or maybe the next. Or the next. I've got to fight all the way now at the longer distances. So slightly disappointed? Well, I got 32 out of 35, so it means I got three inners out of uh, seven shots, so four bulls. But the stand is pretty high here, and you've got to get them all in really at this short distance. And what do you think went wrong? I'm not quite sure. I had two wide ones, which I couldn't account for, and I uh, wound my sights a bit back to get myself in the middle again. Yeah. Got in the middle again, and I just dropped my last one underneath. So. And the conditions are pretty good, aren't Very they? Very easy. Yes. Should, should be getting them all in, really. The flag showed the wind to be constant. Ideal conditions for an expert like Andy Chown. Andy, how did it go? Well, it could have gone better, Brian, but uh, one off at the moment. Misjudged the wind on one. But you're still in with a chance. Oh, in with a chance. Got a few right, anyway. Good. <laughs> what about you, David? Yeah, oh, got some work to do now. Good, good, I, good. Oh, not good really <laughs> at all. Glad to see him working hard. Oh, well, I made a mess of that. I've only had 32 there, so I have to pull my finger out. And how about the wife? I did the worst of all. I got 31. They were... Everywhere. So it might not be a ladies year this year? I don't think so. Not mine anyway. You <laughs> don't know yet. There's a long way to go. <laughs> Karen had to do well at five and six hundred yards to stay in the competition. Bruce Parker shooting his 20th Queen's Prize continued a disappointing performance and failed to qualify for the second stage. Bill Richards was shooting well but David's honour was at stake as the 1984 winner. I've got to make 35 here. That's a possible. If I don't, I'm not going to go through to the second stage. So I've got it all to do. As luck would have it, the weather took a turn for the worse. At the last and most difficult range, 600 yards, the heavens opened. I'm afraid I didn't make it. I only had a 33, which is going to be a total of 98, which, which won't be enough this year. But there's always next year. I'm afraid I really made a mess of that one. It's a bit depressing. Um, I dropped 10 points at one, one range, but uh, never mind, next year. <laughs> well, I had a rather, I think I might say, frustrating day. I started off pretty well at 300 yards with a possible 35. 500 yards was a rather middling sort of shoot. I made 33, but that still left me a chance to recover. But at 600 yards, I got caught in this pouring rain, and my second shot to count, I think must have been affected by the rain. I probably got some rain on the barrel. I got an out at the bottom of the target, which was, uh, to put it bluntly, uh, bloody disappointing, because I got all the other <laughs> shots in <laughs> and made, made a 32, the total of 99, which I'm afraid will be uh, insufficient to get me into the second stage. It's, an, it's a bit annoying when you reach my age, there aren't many more second stages left. <laughs> Judging by the conditions, I haven't done too badly. I mean, I had 33 there, uh, dropping my last though, which is a bit of a shame, but it, uh, it was very, very wet. And it, it really did, at one point, I, I was beginning to wonder whether, I, whether I'd be able to make out the target. It was getting that heavy. But it, it, it cleared up a little bit, and it's now getting even better, needless to say, since we stopped shooting. But uh, it really was pretty awful. At the end of the shooting, the scores are sorted and checked and displayed for all to see. No one knows for certain how they've done until they've seen themselves in print. Major Fulton, congratulations, you got through. Yes, indeed I did. I was very lucky. I, uh, I didn't expect to. On Wednesday evening, I must say, I felt a bit despondent. But yesterday morning, when I came over and had a look at the board, there, to my surprise, was my name. So it gives me another life. I'm on the list, Brian. I made it. Uh, 102. I dropped one at the first range, two at the second, but wheeled them in at the last. 
So you're in the top 300? Top 300 and pleased to be there now. And what about the prospects for stage two? Well, I'm happy. I'm going to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but so are the other 299. <laughs> While Robin settled down to shoot in cross-leg style, frowned upon by military purists but guaranteed comfort and who knows, perhaps success, Bill Richards knew that a place in the final was within his grasp. For the second stage, 10 shots count for a maximum of 50 points at each range. Andy Chown was shooting well, 49 at 300 and 47 at 5. At 600 yards, Robin Fulton topped his 246s with a 48, but it wasn't enough to get him through. How do you go, Bill? Oh, not bad. How many are you drinking? 145. That's a lot of bulls out there. Do oh. you think you'll be in then? Yeah, I'll be in with that. Good. Well done. One more. Seven, seven, seven. Four, I'm surprised they're forecasting uh, scores of one. It's, it's like a bookmaker's board. This. <laughs> oh yes, yes, and it's, it's just as inaccurate as well. <laughs> it took half an hour to sift out the top 100 scores. Every finalist receives a Queen's 100 badge and target instructions for the final the next day. Andy had scored 48 at 600 yards to make a total of 144. He revelled in receiving his eighth Queen's 100 badge. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. Small prize, bigger one champion. Thank you. Well done, Andy. Congratulations. Thank you, Brian. You're in the final. <laughs> well done, Bill. We want a winner out of you two, don't forget. Well, we've got a badge, we're on the way. It's a wonderful place. It's, it's, it's a place of uh, terrific concentration. You, you aim, you fire, you look at the flags, you wonder what you've done wrong, you're pleased when you've done things right. But it's total relaxation. You forget about work, you forget about your family, you forget about the overdraft, everything. And it can be pouring with rain, it can be really cold, and it's still wonderful because it's busy. Final is shot at 900 and a thousand yards. Fifteen shots are fired to count, scoring a maximum 75 points at each range. afternoon wore on and a winner began to emerge, it appeared that it was a name known only to a few. Competing in only his second final, Geoffrey Cox scored 73 at 900 yards with an impressive string of bulls. At a thousand yards, the more difficult range, 
He scored 71. The Queen's prize was his. Bill Richards came 27th, Andy Chown 50th, but in 1986 it is Geoffrey Cox who shares the rare thrill with that select band which began with young Edward Ross of becoming a winner of the Queen's Prize. It's Ken Clawson. Very good. Nice job here that you're doing something to check it. 